Is it rolling? Okay, let's go. Hello and welcome to the Rock on Tours podcast. I am Gary Kemp. And I'm Guy Pratt. They said it wouldn't happen, but here we are, where each week we bribe a friend of ours for an hour of their time <laughs> to chew the cud on life of the fast lane of music. Uh, yeah, we've been mates for a long time, haven't we? Are we now playing a band together? We do play in a band together. But Nick Mason's also full of secrets. And this episode, we are speaking to one of the finest pop producers in the world. Uh, three Brit Awards, a Grammy Award winner, Ivan Novello Award, blah, blah, blah. And a man whose production skills and musical influence earned him the title, The Man Who Invented the 80s. But I thought that was me. No. <laughs> Trevor Horn. Trevor. Hey. How are you, Trevor? I'm fine. It's so nice we, to be here. We go back quite a long way. I think you 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 saved my ass back in 1982 when you remixed Instinction. Instinction. Yeah, well, I always I always liked your band. I really liked um uh, Muscle Bound <laughs> and and which was a in Yours is the, the the one that had the sin drums on the Lindra, oh, uh, not not the the um, chant number one. Chant and, number and one, the really first Simmons liked that. Kit, yeah. yeah, first Simmons kit record. I really liked that. I liked the production on it too. And, and I remember we had a we had a difficult second album, and uh, and, and the third single had not done as well as any of us had hoped. And um, but we knew there was something here. There was gold to be mined, <laughs> and uh, not well. <laughs> that, that was the next album. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Trevor kindly said, "Look, I I I wouldn't want to remix this. I like to mostly re-record it, which which we did with Ann Dudley, didn't we? Yeah, we kind of we gave it the treatment. It was really funny because um, I, I don't know if I ever told you. I probably told you this one where don't go break my heart. Where oh. um, <laughs> the, guy, the guys in ABC were very competitive, and when I said that I was going to remix a track from your amp album. They were really pissed off at me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, you, you know, because we were working on the album, Legacy yeah, yeah, of Love, yeah. and a few days uh, we did it. Yeah, we did it in a couple of days, and it came out really well. Instinction, so it was it was done. And I was back working with with them and. Uh, JJ, the um, the Fairlight programmer, came up with a, a sort of heavy guitar for one little section of one of the songs, and he played it on there. And I always remember Mark came in. It was about ten o'clock at night, and said, "What's that guitar?" And I said, "Oh." Gary Kemp was by, and I said, "Hey, Gary, have a jam on the track." <laughs> <laughs> and Mark went crazy. He believed me for about forty-five. You did that. You let him come in here on track and the whole bit. And I was oh like, "Nah, God. it's a wind-up. It's well, a fair like you how, dumbass." But how? Yeah, how did you? How did you come across ABC? Because that was your kind of jump, wasn't it? Into sort of well, it was. I mean, I suppose dollar, dollar was was, dollar, well, it was very much pop, wasn't it? Um, what was all the buggles were the bubbles. Well, but others were definitely pop. Go on, let's go back. How and, we, yeah. Yeah. and the great thing about pop is, it's, I, I would argue that it's the least conservative of all the musical forms because it evolves with whatever's going on, whereas yes. you tend to have all of the other musical forms sort of get set in aspic and fall away. I mean, let's face it, jazz, you know every kind of jazz now. It's in a museum. But pop evolves because it's like a hamburger, you know, it develops all the time, different ingredients. Obviously, you created a lot of sounds that people have impersonated over the years. But at the same time now, you have to be aware of what people are doing. What is popular? What makes pop music now? And I mean, I listen to, to Capital Radio with my kids and there's not a singer who hasn't got auto-tuned wound to the hilt, you know, and there's no guitars on there. So is that something you think making records now I have to sort of guide, be guided by? I, I was never really guided by anything much other than what I fancied doing. I, I'm not in a position where I have to try and make something that I don't understand. Yeah. Although I often feel like I don't really understand. But, you know, um, you know, I just had this big album with Rod Stewart, but it was putting an orchestra on a bunch of old masters. Yeah. You went know? to number one. That's the kind of thing old guys like me get to do now. It's much more like that yeah. rather than a yeah. you know, young sort of poptastic person who they don't come to old guys. Anymore. Well, I mean, for example, I was a amazed when I because you know how your reputation preceded you before I knew you was uh, as very much the professor and of this kind of uh, working in, in this very much laboratory environment of the studio and what really surprised me is how you're actually way more of a band guy than anyone perceived you to be what you actually really liked was musicians in a room playing, yes absolutely you know, and which is absolutely not how how, because you know, he is well, because you're a be, great yeah. musician a yeah. great player well um, I earned my living playing bass till I was 30 I mean that's how I paid the rent but I always remember in my mid 20s when I was playing at a nightclub seven nights a week you know no nights off what club what club it was Bailey's Club in Leicester and uh <laughs> Seven nights a week. Uh, funny story, I played seven nights a week for a year and I had a week off, right? What do I do on the first night? <laughs> I go down to the club. 
Because <laughs> Harry Seacombe's on. Oh, wow. And all my oh, mates wow. are going to be there, right? So I get out the club. This is Sunday night. And the manager sees me, comes running over. Thank God you're here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm off. It's my holiday. <laughs> and he said, he said the, the guy in Busman's the... Holiday. The busman's holiday. The guy in the replacement band can't read. And Harry Seacombe's stuff's all written out. So can you do Harry Seacombe? So uh, sure. So I got up and borrowed the guy's bass and played behind Harry Seacombe, uh, which was great because I'm a huge Goons fan. And then I gave my father the gig for the rest of the week because my dad was a bass player and he showed up and played behind Harry Seacombe. Uh, well, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So your father was a bass player and yeah. you can read music. So you, you told us that much. How, how did that all begin for you? Yeah, well, my dad, my dad played double bass in a local dance band, but he was an engineer. He was what they used to call back in the day semi-pro. That's how I came to play the bass guitar because he sh- I, I'll never forget, he showed me way down upon the Swanee River on the double bass in G. Bing, 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 way down upon the Swanee. And he said, then he goes to a C. Boo, boo. Ah, I figured it out, you know. I worked it all out for myself, really, from playing the recorder. I didn't have any lessons, but, I, you know, I could read for the recorder. And right. if you think about it, bass parts were pretty simple. Two crotchets in a bar with a crotchet rest in between. And by the middle of the song, it would probably pep up and you'd start to play four. Boom, boom, you start to walk it. And then it would go back down to two again. Yeah. So there's nothing complicated to read. And and if you can read for the recorder, you can do, you can do that. So that's kind of how I sort of started doing it and then one night my dad came home with a bass guitar and said this is going to change the world because now now they know if you're playing the right note or not my dad had because <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. it had frets because it had frets and my dad would get That's... really cross with the other bass players in town because he's some of them he said they're just bluffers they haven't got a bloody clue what they're playing this is up in Durham, you know. They move their hand and they pretend and they make a thump, but they don't know what key the Famous for its bluffing bass players. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, but I always found that I, I always know that, that um, if you listen to... Like, and some of the great jazz bass players, I, mean, I always think it's in, in our world of sort of fretless basses and everything, there's no way we could get away with the sort of tuning that they're allowed to get away with. No, no you couldn't possibly. <laughs> so how, where did you go, go to form your own band? And who was your heroes? No, no, point? no. What happened was, so I, I used to just, uh, you know, some, from when I was about 12 or 13, my dad used to let me play the first set on a Saturday night where nobody was in. And so that was my sort of, uh, you know, that was where I first started doing it and then he sh- showed me the bass guitar I used to spend every you know every evening in a, in a room trying to teach myself how to play the guitar I wanted to start the Beatles and I did eventually have a group called the Outer Limits that I was the lead guitar player in um, on an acoustic guitar you know with a pickup on it and we played Kinks songs and stuff like yeah. that the bass guitar was just something that I did every now and again to de- sit in for my dad or something like that you know then I was a Bob Dylan impersonator I could still do it I could still remember nearly all the verses of Desolation Row you know? oh come on and this, and this is, and this is, this is still up in Durham, is it? Uh, no, this by this point I'd moved to Leicester, and I was doing a you know with the harmonicas, you know, come get around people wherever you roam, you know, I mean all the verses well, of Mr. Yeah, Tambor. Oh, it. It's like he's it. in the room. But actually, it's like he's in the room. room. Yeah. <laughs> actually, this, this, that's a good point because now you've you've showed us that you could do impersonating singers. You that's you ended up doing that for a living for a bit, didn't you? Um, John Anderson. No, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, I meant on, on, like, those, oh, on those Kato uh, records or whatever they were, on the top of the Pops records in the 70s. Did yeah, you well, s- I, I, I mainly did Brian Ferry because they said... You did you, Brian Ferry? You can sing out of tune, so you can do Brian Ferry. So uh, <laughs> come on, come on, let's stick together. <laughs> we made a vow to leave one another never. Oh, that kind of stuff, wasn't it? So for anyone who doesn't know, these were records that you... That would, I, in fact, we had them in our house because we couldn't afford to buy all the singles. So you used to make a record every month, maybe that yeah. had the chart it was every hits couple of months. on, all played exactly like the the original records, but with with yeah. session musicians, not the real band. I first came to London. You know, I played in loads of local mecca bands. What happened is suddenly bass guitar parts became much more complicated, like more or less overnight. Dance music. Mm. Well, well, all the mecca ballrooms were starting to have kids in at the weekend. And the record that, that really kicked all the old double bass, and, and most of the guys, so, so your, your average mecha band would have a horn section, bass, guitar, drums, keyboards, and a couple of singers. And nearly all of the bass players were old double bass players who picked up a bass guitar because it was easier. 
And this group called Love Affair brought out a record called uh, Everlasting Love. Everlast- oh, yeah. Uh, and it was very fast, a very a great bass part. Remember it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is great. I never knew this story. Hearts gone astray, deep and hard when they go. That one. That was a sort of very fashionable bass sound. Do you know who played? Who was it? The person in the band, or would have been like one of the Wrecking Crew or someone? Who did it? would have been. I often wondered if it was John Paul Jones. Oh, it's English. Yeah, it's English. Yeah. Well, it's probably is John Paul Jones. Actually, funny enough, now I get now I get relaxed. I see what, you know, this, this <laughs> emphasis on that driving bass. <laughs> um, so I could play it because I, I learnt it, you know. I was uh, playing semi-pro in a, in a band called the Eric Upton Band. I was about 17 and we were playing four nights a week and it was, you know, like a, had, a, had a small horn section, functions, you know, the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we played everything from waltzes to the late... I used to sing like things like Daydream Believer, White a Shade of Pale and whatever. Hey Jude. <laughs> had you left school? And you were... Yes, I had left school. Yeah, because I was seventeen. Man, mm. I I, no, I really I neglected to... all of my yeah. studies trying to play the guitar. You know what I mean? I'm sure you. you yeah, all yeah, did yeah, the same. Same. yeah, yeah, yeah. And screwed up totally. Exactly. And then you know when I was meant to do classes, never went. But you know I was working at the John Bull Rubber Company. I mean, you want to know how fluky things can get. The uh, the guy sitting behind, I was working in the costing office, trying to cost out how you, a, a little rubber hose that goes between the radiator and the engine, right? <laughs> I had a slide route, I was useless at it. And so I, I, had, I had figured out a whole set of ploys where I could, did basically nothing, you know? You know that line of princes? There was I busy doing nothing but different from the day before. Oh. <laughs> you know, I was, I was an expert at doing that. Looking and busy. He, looking busy. And the guy behind me said, uh, I met a guy in the pub last night, and he's the band leader at the top rank. His name's Johnny Wollaston. And I told him about you, and he's interested. He wants to meet you. I was like, really? Yeah, I said, you know, you were 17 and a half. You played in a semi-pro band and everything. So anyway, sure enough, I go, I go to meet this uh, Johnny Wollaston. He says to me, can you play Everlasting Love? <laughs> First thing he said to me, right? I said, yeah, I can play Everlasting Love. He said, right, come and see my band. It's the benchmark. So yeah, I went and watched a set of, with his band, and I could see at some point in the set they played Everlasting Love, and I could see the guy. The guy was trying to play it with his fingers, and you, you could probably play it with your fingers, but you'd be struggling, man, because, you know what I mean, it's so fast. The slap of a gauntlet going down right there. <laughs> we'll get the bass out. We'll, <laughs> we'll try, right? And at the end, so then at the end of watching that, he said to me, well, do you think you could play with my band? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll leave me your number, I'll bear you in mind. Cut to like six months later, and I've just been fired from my latest job, which was Progress Chaser at a plastic bag factory. Because I'd woken my parents up at four o'clock in the morning and said, I've got this all figured out. I'm going to go into the music business. That's great. I'm going to do it like now because it's hopeless. Anything else is just going to be hopeless. And they went, but it's four in the morning. It's four in the morning. <laughs> and once more oh, the dawn. Exactly. They said, get one more job. Get one more job. I had this terrible job. They fired me. And my dad said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to turn pro. And he said, how are you going to do that? And I said, I'm going to look at the melody maker. He said, but you're not good enough. They've been fired for my job, so I've, I can practice. And anyway, I got up the next morning, and I was just getting ready to go out for the melody maker, and there's a knock on the door, and I opened the door, and it was Johnny Wollaston. It was an extraordinary coincidence. And he came and says, thank God you're here. He came in. He said, I've got a contract. I, 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 will you start with my band in three weeks' time? I was like, yeah. Oh. He said, it's £24 a week uh, for five nights. You OK with that? And I was... Are you kidding? <laughs> I've been getting 10 quid a week for yeah. a 40 hour week, so I signed the contract. I said, Don't you want to hear me play? And he said, No, you'll be fine, I'm sure. And I said, But can I come in and look at all through the parts for the next few days? He said, Yeah, I'll sort it out with the manager. So for the next three weeks, I went in every day and spent like five, seven hours going through all the parts, you know. And then I had my opening night. Of course, I was the kid, and I was only 18, and I was like, this is the most yeah, wonderful thing yeah. that ever happened to me. And all the rest of the band were grumpy old geezers who, who didn't like me. You're too fucking loud, straight away, you know. <laughs> uh, and then uh, hated Johnny Wollaston. <laughs> 
with a passion, you know. And you had your band. own amp and your own kit, or all your own gear. Yes, I, I had a, a Hofner artist bass guitar. Oh, right. Wow. And, oh, right. and yeah. uh, Dominator. Or and a Selma 50 oh, Selma, of course. with an 18-inch speaker in it. So that was how I started, and I never, I never went back to the normal world. In the seventies, though, dance music did sort of become more. Well, no, I'm to uh, of a focus for you lately. W- where, point. where I am now, I'm just at the end of the sixties, man. I've, you know, I was. Uh, this is 69, 68, 69 when I started. Uh, you know, yeah. And who, who did you? Who were your base heroes at that point? My base heroes were probably the guy in the Who. You know, yeah, John Entwistle. Yeah, he was the most exciting one I'd ever seen. And and, and we'd supported them once, the Eric Upton band. Oh, I actually wow. read my music off uh, Keith Moon's drums. And uh, we were on first while they were eat, while they were eat, you know, eating and then we we played for a little bit of general dancing and then the Who came on. It was Leicester University. The the Who were amazing. I mean they were terrific. What year was that? Was, was that would have been sixty eight, sixty nine. Oh, okay. So they were doing either the engine driver Oh yeah, quick one. Quick one. Yeah. Oh that's that peak. Oh man, yeah. yeah. Even the old saxophone players thought they were good. Wow. You know? same so same. that's same And then same. what about London? Did that sort of I, I came to London when I was twenty one. Then I had a kind of uh, as as you do, you know, I got to uh, I took LSD and realised, you know, how terrible what I was doing was. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to turn a new page. And you thought, your I, dad was right. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, Went back to John Bull Rubber Company. <laughs> it wasn't so much my playing, but, but who I was playing with and what I was playing. Right, right, right. I was just playing for money. So I joined, a, I went for an audition. I joined a group called the Canterbury Tales down in... Uh, Oh, where was it? Margate, and they had a. Was, sort that, sort of, sort of, was that sort of? That sounds like an incredible string band. They were okay. I mean, I had a year with them. I never knew. What kind po- of music? Never knew poverty like it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because was it one prog? Of, no, it was. It was. It wasn't prog. We, we did a sort of cross section of stuff. You know, from. Well, it must have had a sort of Merry England oh, vibe. From, like no, like it that, didn't. No? We used to. It was mainly covers because nobody wrote. It wasn't right. original music. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, join a band playing original music, then you, that's even deeper poverty. <laughs> <laughs> We have to push ahead into why you ended up produ- forming Buggles and where all that started. And cause, I mean, was that your first record in your name, as it were? Well, I, I, I got interested in studios when I was with Ray McVeigh because we started to do... Lo- I was interested in them before and I did lots of broadcasts before, you know. But, but with Ray, we were doing lots of things, you know. Um, we do a party album and then, you know, loads of gigs and all kinds of things um, and I'd always go in and listen to the playback and got in trouble a few times for like singing along with it and things like that I decided I could take no more of being on the coach five hours there uh, five hours back two one and a half hour sets of the cavalcade of crap as I used to call it <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I just had to get out of it so I went back to Leicester I left London went back to Leicester started working in this nightclub and built a studio with another guy uh, during the day, we used to work on the studio. A guy gave us a barn, an old barn, and we did all the work ourselves. He paid for the materials, we did the work. Um, they lay bricks, putting in straw board, all kinds of things. We had to, wow. our equipment, which I'd bought with all the money I got from Ray McVeigh, was two Revoxes, an Alice wow. AD62, and four microphones. Uh, one compressor, I think I had. And so you that literally was... learned about studios from the ground up. You know, you put yeah. them in the bo- walls. And so we made. Yeah, how did you know? What did you? I mean, how did you talk to lots of people? Read a couple of books. Decide what a studio was going to be. Yeah, I mean, what, yeah, what I'd, books I'd, were there? Well, we, because I'd, I'd worked in them, you could, you could get a book. <laughs> was it East Lake making studios at that point? Yeah, but I mean, you know, I was, <laughs> I was crap lake. Um, <laughs> East Midlands. Uh, it took it took <laughs> near, it took near a year, and of course, by the time we finished, we, we got no business. I oh, somehow so, thought, what, what business did you think? I had there no was idea. Be in Leicester, I had uh, no idea, but I started. Come to Leicester. I started to make a few records, and uh, I, you know, under what I, title? Under what I name? saw a guy, guy in a talent competition at Leicester Bailey's, who sang <laughs> sang terrible songs about about ghastly things that happened that he'd written himself. I, rec- I decided to call him Daniel Doom and I recorded him <laughs> and sent them off but you know, got rejections. Uh, I did a, a Leicester, this is the season for Leicester, record with the Leicester football team. We did that. By, the, by that point we had an engineer 
<laughs> Does that still exist? That record? That? Yeah, it'll be, it, you'll probably be able to find it. It's the big one. So that was your first production. Makes you do a, a remix of that for when they won the won the league. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, the problem was that this. It was done by a private guy, and he had five thousand of them printed up because Leicester were doing really well that year. And then the next week they got kicked out. <laughs> so who was your inspiration? George Martin. That's as a producer. Yeah. A producer. Yeah, anyway, some some guy, I was getting to the point, some guy said to me, uh, you know what you're doing is called being a record producer. Right. I was like, that's what a record producer, I never knew. From that moment, it took me like five years of making publishers demos to in the end, video kill the radio star, you know. I, I had a couple of minor things before it, but... What, what were they? What? Thing called Monkey Chop with Dan I. Are oh, you kidding? Yeah. Oh, that's, wow. Uh, I was in a band with him. I lived in the squat that he lived with him <laughs> in Elgin Avenue. My yeah. first squat was with Dan I. Wow. wow. So, so. Mm. But, but how did your relationship come together when you formed Buggles? Well, Jeff Jeff was my keyboard player. He was in the team. You see, for years I was Tina Charles' MD. Whenever Tina Charles, because I'd been a boyfriend. It was a fairly tempestuous relationship, but it was still going at that point. And, uh, I, I love to love, wasn't it? I love to love. Yeah. And uh, I always... Say you know, people ask me about uh, that, that I, I learned more from listening to the backing track of I Love to Love. So I'd never heard a backing track done by a hit record producer. Do you know what I mean? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I was trying to work out the f how the fuck do you do it, man? Uh, that was like a real disco template, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was like that, a disco template. Yeah. And I thought, he's done it with a drum machine so that they're all perfectly in time. So what was the drum machine around then? It, it, was, um, it was probably had the same thing that we had, Mini Pops Junior. Which was a, like it's basically a, the thing that was in an organ, wasn't it? Was it was in a hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just to hear, you know, I was always fighting with drummers. Do you have to put so many kick drums in? Do you have to do that? <laughs> Can't you do whatever? Gearing. Oh, I love to love just how the floor precise the, floor. the whole thing was. And dry. And, and dry and kind of cold, but spot on. You know what I mean? I thought that's how you do it. That's how you got to get it to sound. So from that moment on, unless there was a, a, a good reason. I did everything to some kind of a groove, just made everything more easy, editing, echo lens. The drums always come first, the bass and drums. Absolutely, but I'm sure you had the same sort of feelings. You, you, you know, if you think about it, the end, towards the end of the 70s, punk came along. Punk was just horrible, but it kind of blew the door wide open. It meant you could do anything, anything at all. I mean, if people would listen to that crap, you know, you could get away with anything. <laughs> well, the, but the point... The there was a thing, couple of good records. Well, yeah, but, right. that's not, no, but the, point of, the whole point of punk, it seems to me, is, is because it was the 80s were basically born out of punk. Mm -hmm. The point of it was, was the whole point was just do it yourself. It's like, if you don't like the music that's out there, then start a band. You don't, there's no magazine song to you, start a magazine. Yeah. And I always you know, think the 80s so, were... So, the, the, yeah. the, the three defining sort of styles would have been uh, the Sex Pistols meets Chic meets Craftwork. You know, there was there was. See, it's sort of, but don't forget, don't forget, if you're a record producer, you're up against Elton John, and Elton okay, John yeah, records yeah. sounded amazing yeah. because it was a great team of musicians. They really knew what. I was they playing were doing. Funeral for a Friend the other day. Which yeah, was still an brilliant incredible. sounding record. Yeah. Put it on your stereo. Led Zeppelin. You know, the Eagles, mind you, the Eagles didn't sound that good at the start. But still, you were, you, you know, you're going to make a record. What the hell are you going to make that's going to yeah, be yeah. Make anywhere it for, near as you make good it as for that? The world? You know, yeah. so that yeah. was... Uh, so do just so well, techno, was techno was like manna from heaven. It was here is a way. When I heard Man Machine, yeah. I thought, wouldn't it be great to kind of do a mainstream record that got in the top 20 but, but had a mechanical beat behind it? But that was our influence as well, over at the Blitz Club, you know, yeah. we playing, you know, Russ Egan's playing Man Machine. And, and probably that, Warm Leatherette. And, and Warm Leatherette, and I went out and bought, we bought, we all clubbed together, and we went from being a post-punk band into a band with a synthesizer. And I yeah. took the synth home and wrote all of the next first, of all of our first album. Yeah. It was that exciting, wasn't it? And, yeah. And monophonic. Oh yeah, the monophonic synthesizer. Yeah, the only person who 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 really did a good record tracking synth up was Gino Vanelli. Remember Gino? Oh, Vanelli? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love yeah. of my life. He was a bit fruity, Gino, but and <laughs> and, and they were well jazz rock. Brother to brother, some great drumming on that. I've, I've got to listen to that again. Actually, well, isn't the story? Isn't it that um, ABC were a kind of human leaguey electro type band? But then there was this legendary gig. Apparently, um, Chic played at the Sheffield Odeon. Yeah. And everyone, like all the skinheads, went to like, beat up all the Soul Boys. And apparently, it's become it's this absolutely legendary gig that it sort of turned the whole. Everyone just fell in love with Chic, and, it turned, and sort of ABC oh, became really? the band that. they became. Yeah. And, well, you're, yeah. you're you're quite right. Because Human League came out of Sheffield as well, yeah. didn't they? ABC used to. Uh, Carry, they told me in the ga band that they were in before ABC, they carried the gear around in a carrier bag. 
that they were quite weird. I mean, I, mean, I didn't know what to make of them anyway. I didn't know why they were. Yeah, how did they come to you? Seemed... Well, it was my late wife saw them. They just had a hit with uh, the tears of not enough. Tears are not enough. And uh, and she said, I've found the perfect band for you because they're, they're really good writers and they're bright, but they need somebody to make the records better. And I think I was one of the, quite a few people they saw. But, you know, I... Because you'd already done d Dollar, hadn't you? I'd done Dollar, I'd been in Yes Which as well. Which I thought I Dollar, so. Dollar was, I mean, for me, that was, yeah. that's still one of the great po well, pop I, records, I, that, uh, yeah. intelligent pop records. The production stood out for me. Oh, well, it was all very analogue. If you listen to the start of Mirror Mirror, it sort of goes blip, 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 blip. And then, then there's the sound of a bottle smashing and everyone, hey! And I mean, I had to literally smash the bottle. Your a idea, bottles, though. Yeah, uh, with a couple of spanners on a tarpaulin in the studio with mics <laughs> above it. You know, Gary Langan recorded it. Because you see place. music, you hear music very visually, don't you? I yeah, think. yeah, absolutely, yeah. This was, and this was a perfect act for you because they were kind of, they weren't, you know, writing their own stuff. They weren't, you yeah. know... They just said to me, you make a Buggles record and we'll sing it. Like. So I tried to think about their world because I normally write the lyrics and, and we came up with sort of four songs... That, their little world, them falling in love, them being in love, them falling out and them seeing each other. You know, that was what it was like. <laughs> but I think there was also uh, this feeling of responsibility that, uh, with the new decade starting. And this was 1980s, you know, and we were... Yeah. And, and you're at the beginning and you've got to make the sound sound like the future, haven't you? You've got to do something that doesn't sound like the 70s. That yeah. must, that's, the, that's part of the inspiration, isn't it? Yeah, but by that point, I was a bit more confident, you know. I'd, I'd done a PS album as well, drama, and so I'd, I, I, re I really knew how to work 48-track analogue, you know. So what became your guiding <laughs> principles in production? in production? Did you have a kind of like, oh, I think I've discovered I'm, I'm doing something that no one else is doing, and... Well, I, I I discovered at a certain point that it was pointless trying to imitate other people. It always came out wrong. And uh, it came... Whatever I did, it sounded a certain way. So I thought, maybe I'll just exaggerate that. I'll exaggerate it more, you know, like... Uh, I'll, I'll just... I, I, like the drum? Yeah, yeah. just coming you know, out. Exaggerate this idea of picking things, you know, like... On, you know, Video Kill the Radio Star, there's no programming or anything. But, you know, just the way that we use the voices, the our O's and everything. That was from years of being in the studio. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, uh, when I first ever engineered, I discovered that real stereos, bollocks, right? If you put something left, hard left, and then different thing, hard right, that's much more interesting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, any kind of stereo. These days, I mean, it drives me nuts. Every bloody keyboard overdub is meant to be in stereo. I mean, why? Did you ever get a band, <laughs> did you ever get a band saying to you, we can never do this live. Yes. Because <laughs> that, that's... <coughs> listening no to, if, you listen to, <laughs> if you listen to your records, Trevor, I and mean, that's partly the beauty of them, that it sounds like nothing that can be reproduced live, and yeah, you're getting play, a different experience. Yeah, we play them live, you can play them live, they work They work well. It just depends which ones, you know? The Frankie, Frankie ones, you, you have to use a bit of track, but we don't, we play yeah. two tribes, we don't play with any track. You know, so. but, you're, but when you're inventing it in the studio, it's the studio as an instrument, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, they started using the studio as an instrument, the Beatles, yeah. you know, George Sergeant Martin, Beatles. that whole bit, you know, yeah. when they, once they got their heads in there. I've been re actually reading a lot about the Beatles lately, and it's, you know, something I, I, I never thought about, but loads of, loads of the times when they did their lead vocals, they slowed the tape down so that they, they came back, you know, semitone up. To make yeah. their voices oh, yeah, yeah, sound yeah. more youthful, because well, a couple of times I thought, oh, no, oh, no, no. They were doing here, there, that. and everywhere is 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 has that. I know really? that one's that one's tuned tuned up higher. But also, it's quite surprising in some way, like how technologically basic it was. But mm. then also, there's stuff that's quite technologically advanced, which I always find quite surprising about the Beatles stuff. You know, yeah. Like I, I always thought that um, uh, putting a piano through a Leslie, putting anything else through a Leslie, was invented on echoes. There's, there's a story that it was Floyd insisted oh, right, okay. on them taking it apart. But then I just heard the um, that the White album demos, and they've got everything going through the Leslie on that. Yeah, so they had, yeah. they already had a thing of putting everything, vocals and everything, through the Leslie. For no, instance. absolutely. And they had vo voltage control things where they could sync tapes and stuff, didn't they? But you started to make a point a while back is uh, when you said that I'm a, a sort of a band guy. Yeah. I, my favourite way of, 
of doing stuff is always to to use a group of players because you know a lot of the time you're dealing with the same few chords you know you know a to f sharp minor to d D or whatever. Write this down. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean. And yeah. and some people and and you need people who can take those three chords and make them sound interesting. Yeah. And that's a gift. Some people can play well and they're good, but some people can just do interesting things that, that you, you, know, like, I, that I, you need. I, I, I worked with you so five yeah, years ago on a, yeah. On, yeah. On, a, on a few tracks, and I know you like to put the band down almost as it is in rehearsals first. Mm. I think what was impressive about working with you was uh, you then, you, you could take those tapes home, hard drives home, mm. and sit and chop them up and think, mm. well, we don't have to start this way. Maybe I could take a bit of this middle eight here and I, I can start with that. that. Yeah. And that's that's and probably the, the most exciting part for you, isn't it? Restructuring the song and if also it, the most important part. If it needs it, if it needs it. Right. Sometimes it does depend. What are you saying, Trevor? <laughs> 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 well, quite often writers, you know, the writers don't, you know, uh, they... they they like one bit better than another, and it's not necessarily the best bit. Yeah. But it's always that thing of trying to make it into a coherent form. That's record production. I always think yeah. that's, in a way, that's one a of the series most, of events. One of the most important parts of it, you know, just just editing the song into a good shape so that it's satisfying. I still love my one of my favourite things in the world to listen to still and never ever gets old is um, is the version of Slave to the Rhythm where it's just the whole backing track. And then the whole song. Yeah. Oh, for right. some reason, it, it, and to me, it doesn't seem complete until I've heard... I mean, <laughs> for me, I, I mean, that's still one of my favourite things you've ever done, Slave to the Rhythm. And yet it was probably one of the hardest things for you to give birth to, wasn't it? <laughs> well, well, no, I, I was just a bit out on the limb because they only wanted a single. And... Uh, <laughs> And I, I did it, did it once, and I didn't like it very much because it was like a marching band. But you must have known the song had something. It was. I liked the title, but it was originally. Work all day as men who know. And Grace actually originally sang it like that, but I didn't like it. I just, you know, I thought this is going to go on an album with Sly and Robbie. I can't possibly put this on there. Right. This is just so... And I don't think it'll fit. We need to find a way of doing it. Doing. And I ended up using a go-go rhythm. And when I played, when Bruce heard the go-go rhythm, he came up with those chords and we oh, just rewrote right. the song around it. But, you know, the whole th the whole track's made up of uh, of one little one-minute thing that they played when they were warming up. Because there, there's really? all sorts of great apocryphal tales about your record. And I'm sure I've probably asked you this before and you've probably said no. But Because there, there was one story that went around for years, which is that the hi-hat on that record is actually J.J. Bell, the guitarist, just going... T -t 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 -t. Now, the hi-hat on one of the tracks is Louis Jardine doing that. Oh, so OK. Exactly. Doing yeah. that, is it really? Wow. Yeah, we were thinking of... An, He's one of the great percussionists. Yeah. Yeah, and we were thinking, we say, you know, we need a hi hat, but oh, it sounds so dull. I said, why don't you sing it, Lou? See what it sounds like. I do it, Trevor. No problem. No problem. <laughs> and I guess, I guess, what made that such a great record in the end is you, you had the money and the time to to keep it going. I, I mean, never thought about it. It's money. not like a week of you've got to have this record out. You no, no, I got carried away. Oh, 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 I started oh, 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 doing oh. other versions of it and whatever. You know, even got Dave to play on it. That's right. Yeah, but he's uh, it's uh, but he's not on the record, is he? Yeah, he is. Oh, is, on it the track the, is it the metal version? Is it on sure. the fashion show, which oh. is the sort of very uh, programmed sort of version of the record. It has sort of talking on it, and it builds up into a guitar thing. Oh, yeah, I'll point it out to if you. Somehow. If you had to pick one record to be remembered by that you did in that period, what would it be? I don't know. Um, the sort of proud moments. I don't know. I never felt that like that. I was always too proud too hungry. about the next one. Too hungry. Because uh, <laughs> you know, even like, because after the eighties finished, you 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 met Seal, and you ended up making that those incredible yeah, records with him. I I, I think that. And, and they were kind of quite different to Frankie. The whole ethic was different. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose if I if I have to listen to anything I, of my own, I tend to go back and listen to Seal, you know? Yeah. No. yeah. The yeah. first two albums and the fourth album I'm particularly fond of, you know? How did he come to you? Jill said she wanted a modern-day Nat King Cole. Then Jill got very enthusiastic. She played me crazy, his demo of it, but I, I didn't think much of it because he put his voice through a phaser. Uh, and she was saying, he's got a terrific voice. And I was like, oh, he's through a phaser, I can't tell. <laughs> you know what I mean? And <laughs> she said, you've got to meet him. I got a shot when I met him because he was wearing Cuban heel boots. He's six foot seven, six foot eight. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, 
you meet somebody like within and you, you, you wonder what they're going to be like and within sort of five minutes I had a total musical hard on for him I couldn't wait to get him in front of a Do you know what I think well, I, th- <laughs> I, I remember actually being at Hook End and you playing me some stuff I can't remember but what it was but it was from that album but and what I thought immediately was because you're when you make a production yeah everything has got its space in the EQ world uh, you don't there doesn't seem to be things overlapping in the same yeah. tones and his voice he just has this beautiful high sort of sound tone that's that cuts yeah. through and, and you can fill around it can't you it doesn't suck up all the space well it was a, a funny moment on crazy because we went mad doing crazy so so paranoid so we're following the killer you know number one no yeah. pressure, you know. Yeah, no yeah. fucking. But pressure. he hadn't even been credited on that, had he? No, he wasn't even That's credited on that. Extraordinary. Yeah, they were stupid. They said sign this contract where you take your voice off the record, and he said take my voice off the record. Not signing any contract. So who did, who did it come out with us instead? Because oh, Jill, oh. Jill got him. She spent ages wow. getting him, and then I had to coax him into the studio um, because he, he part of the deal was he was working with Guy Sigsworth, but they'd spent six weeks and they were getting nowhere. Um, it wasn't an easy record to make, but by the time I'd, I'd, I'd got, I got it, I remember when we were mixing it, Jill came into the mix. I said, what do you think? She said, he's not loud enough. Seal's not loud enough. I didn't pay all this money not to hear him. So, okay, push him up. <laughs> Is this loud enough? No, louder. Huh? I said, push him up. <laughs> I said, she said, that sounds right. I, think, I remember the engineer jumped up and, you know, did that kind of a thing. Because you're said, worried about the track getting I said, okay, darling, let, let me deal with it. Deal with it. <laughs> uh, and we just did that old, old trick where, you know, we put it through a, like American Radio Limiter where every time Seal sung, the track got backed off enormously. Oh, really? And then the minute he stopped, the track came right back up again. Really exaggerate. I've done it loads of times. It does work. I mean, you put the whole track through the limiter at the end. Yeah, well, two sets of limiters. We had it through an SSL limiter, and then over the top of it because every time Seals, I think we had the track through a limiter. Seal not through. Obviously, had probably a tube tech on him um, because there was no no EQ on Seal, no EQ wow. button, wow. no wow. keep off the wow. EQ. That's all his that, that lovely yeah. resonance. Yeah. yeah. And it sort of worked, you know. Uh, you can hear it on the record, plain as day. And with Seal, you know, the basic trick was that when he's down low, have him drying in your face, and when he goes up high, put him back with a little bit of reverb on him. It works. A bit of spin or something. Mm. Yeah, well, whatever. Trevor, thank you. I think we might yeah, have to we're out of time. Yeah. wrap Damn. up. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, well, good. Thanks we for this. touched Espe- on a few things. Especially in the early yeah, days. Wow. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes, the early days. So that's it for the episode of Rock on Tours today with Trevor Horn. And uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can send an email to guyandgary at podcastworks.com. Mm-hmm.